So now that we've covered both periphera and cnidaria, which again you can kind of follow along down here uh, on this phylogenetic tree. So we went to the parazoa, which was kind of the uh, beside animals. So our sponges, which are animals, but not quite. They, they don't have a lot of common characteristics with animals. And then we went into the eumetazoa, so looking at our true animals. And we looked at our radial organisms, the cnidarians. So now what we're going to do is we're going to follow this phylogenetic tree to our bilateral organisms. And all of our bilateral organisms are triploblastic. So they have the endoderm, the ectoderm, and what we don't see in our diploblastic, they have a mesoderm. Now, as you can see, when we get into bilateral organisms, we have a second split. And this split is going to protostoma uh, and deuterostomia, which is the protostomes and the deuterostomes. And where we're going to go first is we're going to go down the protosomes first. Then from here, we have another split between ex uh, ectisi wow, ectisozoa and lophotrochozoa. These two words we'll talk about more as we talk about each of those organisms, but what we're going to start with is phylum, uh, sorry, superphylum, ectisozoa, and then we're going to talk about our nematodes first. Now, I have this new word up here, superphylum. Now, you know, and I'm going to kind of summarize it over here, we know we have domain, kingdom, and I'm going to leave a gap on purpose, phylum, I'm going to leave another gap, class, and I'm not going to do all of them because we're not really going to talk about the other ones. Now this superphylum, scientists came up with these in-between categorizations just because some phyla uh, and some kingdoms just have so many organisms um, that it was more meaningful to split them up even more, that there had been way too many phyla if we had just done the phyla level. So we have two prefix prefixes that you'll see with these organizations. So you'll see superphyla, so a superphyla or superphylum, Oh goodness. Uh, superphylum is found above phylum. And then we have another term, sub. So that prefix sub meaning below. So subphylum. With classes, it's the same thing. There's superclass. And then there's subclass. Not every single organism, actually most organisms, don't have a superphylum and a subphylum and a superclass and a subclass. It's kind of found, uh, random's not quite the right word, but randomly throughout the animal, plant, bacteria, kingdoms. Um, we see it a lot in um, this section, particularly um, with the Dysozoans, just because there are so many of them. There's so much diversity um, within this part of this kingdom um, that they wanted to break it down even more before even going to the phylum level. So just so we're in superphylum ectisozoa, and then the phylum that we're going to talk about is phylum nematoda. So this superphylum name again is ectisozoa, and what ectisozoa means is it's referring to ectisis, which you can see spelled up here. Ectisis, which is the process of molting. You might be familiar with molting um, snakes, for example, do it. Snakes are different, though, but um, the idea of getting rid of your excess skin. Well, with ectisis, what's happening is that most or a lot of these organisms, you can think about insects. They have this hard exoskeleton, and it's so hard that the organism actually cannot grow within it. And so what it does, depending on the species, it might molt once a year or multiple times a year, it will molt or get rid of its old exoskeleton uh, in favor uh, for this softer exoskeleton where it can grow quite quickly before it hardens. And it repeats this process multiple times in its life. Uh, here's a gif of a cicada, and you actually may have seen leftover cicada exoskeletons, uh, which is kind of cool and kind of creepy at the same time. So ectisozoans, 
zo, referring to animals, are animals that do ecdysis. Uh, so that's where that name ecdysozoan is coming from. Now, as I said, the phylum that we're going to talk about in this video is phylum nematoda. And nematoda uh, colloquially is referred to as the round worms. And just if you want to take a guess, yes, these worms are actually round. Uh, this matters because we're going to talk about flat worms uh, later, which are quite literally flat, uh, and segmented worms, which are actually segmented. Lots of worms out there, but they do have quite different morphologies. So if you recall back to our phylogenetic tree, uh, one of the branches that phylum nematoda was on was on those that were bilaterally symmetrical. And sometimes this is a little hard to imagine because if you think of a worm, if you were to hold the worm, say, upright, I mean, it is a circle, and in circles you could, you know, have tons of lines of symmetry. But the way a worm is organized is that if you cut it in half, the left and right side are similar. But if you cut it in the other direction, that is not the same. So imagine the length of the body cutting it in half, not, oh, I'm going to look down at it. It's a circle, therefore it's radial. So these are bilaterally symmetrical organisms. Again, because we're bilateral, uh, we're going to see triploblastic organisms. So they have all three of those germ layers. Now, because we have all three germ layers, this means we can now be categorized as either acelomate, pseudocelomate, or eucelomate. Remember, you have to be a triploblast in order to be considered one of these three things. And if we look at our organisms, these guys are pseudocelomates. Of all the phyla that we're going to talk about in this class, these are the only ones that are pseudocelomates. You can see down here that here is their endoderm in yellow, here is the ectoderm in blue, and then here, uh, this pinkish layer is the mesoderm. But the mesoderm is not lining the endoderm. So this is what I mean by lining it. So if my red pen is representing uh, mesoderm, if this was a true coelom, if this was a eucelomate, we would have seen that endoderm lining everything, but we don't. We don't see that. The digestive system is almost uh, loose inside the body. It's not anchored by the mesoderm. So this is referred to as a pseudocelomate. Our digestion is also getting a little bit more advanced, at least with these guys. Uh, these guys have complete digestion. So one end of the worm uh, is the mouth and the other end of the worm is the anus. So we have two openings uh, for the ingestion of food and the excrement of waste. And then finally, remember if we looked at where we kind of were uh, in our phylogenetic tree, we are with the protostomes. So remember proto meaning first, stome referring to mouth. So when this organism is developing, it is forming the mouth side of its digest digestive tract first, then the anus. And then kind of what's most famous uh, or how these nematodes are most famous is when it comes to human health, uh, uh, because uh, a lot of nematodes are parasitic. So in the picture that you see kind of in the middle of the screen, if you haven't figured out what this is, uh, so that's a whole bunch of nematodes, and this is a dog's heart. Uh, so if any of you have pets, uh, particularly dogs, hopefully you guys are giving it a monthly heartworm medication, and it's for this. It's because a, a heartworm infection is so, honestly, just dramatic. A heartworm is actually spread by mosquitoes. A mosquito bites a dog that has heartworm, carries larvae to another dog that it bites. Um, so really, really important because you can't really prevent your dog from getting mosquito bites. Uh, so really important that you're giving your dog heartworm medication because it can be kind of depressing uh, if your dog ends up like this. Let me talk about another example. Um, although, of course, we all love dogs. Uh, let's take a look at a human uh, parasite. I will tell you that this parasite is um, definitely in the um, decline. The Carter Foundation is looking 
at eradicating a lot of these parasitic diseases and has been very successful. And if you're more uh, in, interested in learning about the Carter Foundation, I um, highly encourage it uh, or the Carter Center. So anyway, the guinea worm is something that's kind of prevalent in more tropical areas. And although there is kind of a, a long uh, or large life cycle here, I'm going to kind of simplify just the steps that I'm most interested in you guys knowing. So where we're going to start, it says number one up here, but what I actually want to do is start with number five. So this parasite, um, this guinea worm, uh, when it's a larvae, it's microscopic, you and I cannot see it, and this microscopic larvae can actually live free living in the water. Uh, so it doesn't always have to be in a host. So I'm gonna go over here and I'm gonna re just renumber this. So um, microscopic larvae in water. And what they um, end up happening is these organisms called copepods. And we've actually seen copepods before in a previous lab. And what happens is these copepods eat them because it's food and that looks delicious. And it's also microscopic, so it could have been an accident. Uh, so I'll just say copepods eat. Now you would think that this parasite is in trouble, right? That it just got consumed by something, but it got consumed by exactly what it wanted to be consumed by. If it got consumed by a fish, it probably would have died. If it got consumed uh, by a mosquito larvae, it probably would have died but it got consumed by a copepod. And parasites, similar to viruses, are very specific with their hosts. That this larvae has uh, a certain set of adaptations to very specifically live in a copepod. The inside of a copepod is um, X percent saline. It is this certain pH. It has um, this um, temperature. It has the right conditions that initiate that parasitic larvae uh, to, to grow a little bit. It can't grow in other organisms, but if it's in a copepod, it can grow. Now the next step, uh, this guinea worm parasite has two hosts. One is the copepod. This is where it lives in kind of the larvae stage. Its second host is us, is humans, is homo sapiens. And so the way we get it is if we drink uh, well, I'm just going to say drink water. I don't want you guys to worry about this being in your tap water. But if you're maybe in a developing country and you're drinking from a, a local pond or from a well or something that's untreated, you might be ingesting copepods. You can barely see copepods. They're not microscopic. You can see them, but they look like little white fluffs in water. And if that is your only source of drinking water, you don't really care about it. You're going to drink it. Now the copepod itself is fine. If you and I were to drink copepods, we probably wouldn't even notice. However, inside of some of these copepods is this guinea worm larvae. And this guinea worm larvae, when it's in a human, can sense the right temperature, the right pH, the right salinity, the right nutrients, the right everything. And it's going to initiate this larvae to start growing, growing into an adult. It's not a larvae anymore. It is now starting to grow into an actual adult, a long worm, a large worm inside of our bodies. It does this in our stomach area. Um, that you don't need to worry uh, about too much. So we drink water. Um, I'll do step four. Uh, worm matures, so we're not a larvae anymore. Then um, some reproduction happens, don't worry about that um, because what's really the most interesting and the most scary is what happens next. When the worm matures, the female, after being fertilized, goes to the surface and specifically it goes to the surface of the feet. So here's someone's foot and it kind of forms this blister and that's what it looks like. It just looks like a large blister. But the adult female worm worm is inside that blister. It isn't pus. It isn't blood. It's a freaking worm. Uh, and the reason why 
this worm migrates down to the foot is because, remember those larvae are found in water. Those larvae need to be in water. So what happens is the female uh, goes to the foot and is going to release larvae out of your foot. Your foot is literally a pus ball of worms that is now being released into the water. Uh, and this happens, this is a pretty long process. Uh, it can be up to a year before um, the female emerges. The larvae will leave, but it might take a year before the female actually leaves the body. Uh, so yeah, pretty disgusting. Uh, so I'll make that the step five. So five um, larvae released out of your foot. And remember, it's important that it's the foot because the goal of the worm is to get back to the water. It could go to your hand, but your foot's more likely to be in the water than your hand is. Uh, so larvae released into water. So there you go, guinea worm. Not to freak you guys out, but don't drink random water. You should not drink water in the environment. And this is just one of many reasons why. Now, what's also cool about the guinea worm is you've probably seen this symbol before. Uh, it's kind of used as the healthcare symbol. Uh, and there's a couple different ideas of what the origin is. Um, some people think it has an origin with Hermes in Greek or Roman mythology, whichever one it is. Um, another hypothesis, because this symbol was developed a very long time ago, another hypothesis for it is that it's actually guinea worm. And the stick that this snake or guinea worm is wrapped around is actually the treatment for guinea worm. So I'm going to show you this picture in a moment, but it's it's a little gruesome, so you, you might not want to see it. And I'll give you for, for fair warning. So when the female starts developing this blister, like I said, it could be up to a year before the female itself leaves. The larvae will be leaving um, from this blister, but the adult female is there. It's got tons of swelling around it. It's quite painful. And so one of the cures for guinea worm is I'm taking a stick, and literally that's all it is, it's a stick, and you almost pop the blister to get one end of the adult female out and then you literally start churning the stick and and spooling this worm around the stick which doesn't look too unfamiliar from this healthcare symbol so for those of you who are like i really don't want to see this picture um just ignore the rest of this for the rest of you i'm going to go ahead and show you this picture so here you can see here someone's foot. You can see all the swelling that's happening. Here is the female that's literally being pulled out of um, this person. And I mean, that right there is probably like six inches worth of worm. And there's probably a whole lot more. This other person has just a small little stick in their hand, just winding it up. And this is essentially the, I wouldn't call it a cure, but a treatment of the guinea worm. All right, I'm switching the slide. Uh, so that's where we're going to end uh, with this phylum uh, before talking about the next one. So again, phylum nematoda, they are bilateral, they're protostomes, and they're in ichthyozoa. So although you think of a worm not having a hard exoskeleton, um, these guys do, or at least it's not a flexible exoskeleton. They do get rid of the outer layer uh, of their skin. Uh, in order to grow in the future. But you're going to see that a lot more easily with our next phylum.